So thank you for being here, oh, sorry, um, despite some competition, what's that mean? Okay, uh, hello everybody, thanks for being here. Um, I am Luca Cerezoli, I am an embedded Linux engineer at Bootling. We do uh, development on embedded Linux, especially Linux kernel by drivers, uh, build systems, uh, bootloaders, firmware, and so on. We are very open source oriented, and uh, we also do uh, trainings. And uh, I am mostly doing uh, kernel device driver development. And uh, recently, I developed a, I mainlined a um, audio codec driver, which was a, an obligation and an opportunity to, to learn about DAPM, which is the subject of this talk. And I live in Bergamo, in the north of Italy. So, uh, uh, let me first introduce the topic with a bit of background, starting from the big picture to what DAPM actually is. So, uh, you probably know that ALSA is the Advanced Linux Sound Architecture, so it's the audio subsystem within the Linux kernel. It exists since more than 20 years now, uh, so it's very uh, clearly its API are working well because they are still in use. And um, so ALSA, when it was introduced, it was in the era of you know, sound, blast, sound Blaster and similar. So the abstraction of a, a sound card was uh, conceptually pretty simple. So one sound card is one device, which is a data bus to connect it to the CPU, the memory, the, 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 the central processing, and audio on the other side. Uh, and as such, it was uh, modeled in the Linux kernel. So it is one device, which has one driver. Uh, it exposes to user space uh, an interface which is um, pro uh, providing uh, playback streams, uh, capture streams, and key controls which allow to modify various settings uh, such as gains, uh, muting, uh, selecting path for MOOCs, and so on. So uh, it, this works pretty well for this kind of uh, sound cards, but it doesn't uh, easily allow to reuse components. So when uh, uh, sound cards start reusing some of the components from another model, but not all. It was becoming a bit complicated to reuse the code. And this was even more uh, relevant for embedded systems where it is totally normal to mix and match components. So you can use the same codec with a different system on chip or the same system on chip with a different codec. And then maybe you add an amplifier. So all these components uh, can be mixed and matched. And so the model was not uh, perfect for this aspect. So uh, ASOC, ALSA for system on chip was added uh, a few years later. Uh, the idea is that a sound card is not anymore a single component. It is a, a group of multiple components, uh, and each of them has a device driver, a separate device driver, and the sound card itself is an, has another driver which uh, glues together them. But the user space API is, is not different, so you still use the sound card in the same way with the same tools. Uh, this works uh, very well. Uh, and there is, um, however, a specific need in uh, sound components, um, which uh, usually in, in the audio world, especially codecs, they allow uh, to uh, have a very flexible routing. So you can uh, select the path of the analog sound in very uh, sophisticated ways. Uh, you can see in the picture just a, a piece of, a, a small part of, of the block diagram for a codec. Um, as you can see for the each decimator can receive its input either from a digital microphone or from an analog mi microphone. And depending on the path you, you want to use, different components are needed. Uh, for example, the Sigma Delta and the PGA are not needed if you use the digital microphone. So for power uh, efficiency, it's better to, dis uh, to turn off whatever is not used in the path of the sound. Um, this is, however, not very uh, easy to, to implement uh, in code, or not necessarily difficult, but difficult to uh, maintain because there are lots of possible combinations. So either you have a driver that enables everything, which is simple but uh, consumes too much power, uh, more than needed, or you have a complex driver with lots of ifs and else, which it's a bit tricky to maintain. For this reason, ASOC uh, from the beginning contains DAPM or DAPM, which is the Dynamic Audio Power Management. Uh, it is the subcomponent in ASOC handling this. Um, so there is already lin uh, runtime power management in Linux, which works very well, but it's not suitable for this because it works at the device level at higher granularity. And uh, for sound, it's, uh, it's a bit different because there you, you can have uh, hundreds of components in the same codec very small components of the audio path that can be enabled or disabled. 
so DAPM is a, an independent uh, power management mechanism. It is in, uh, independent and can coexist, and it does coexist with runtime VM. Uh, it is totally transparent to user space, so you, you don't have, uh, you don't control uh, DAPM from user space. It just works automatically when you enable and disable the features and you change your routing. Um, so every element in DAPM is described as uh, a big graph, uh, a big connected graph. So each item in the graph is called a widget and it represents uh, an item in the uh, hardware that can be enabled or disabled, turned on or off. And each connection between two widgets is called a route. And DAPM automatically enables the components that are on the active routes. Uh, look at the two pictures at the bottom. If you want to capture from an analog input, you need to enable the IDC. If you capture from a digital microphone, you don't. So uh, DAPM will automatically enable and disable the IDC. You don't have to write any code or do anything in user space to enable and disable that. So, uh, and also this works uh, thanks to uh, the K controls. So the K controls, which are user exposed, uh, are uh, controlling the path and some components. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I hear my, my voice back. Uh, it's one, two, three. Yeah, better now. Thank you. Uh, so uh, each uh, widget uh, can have a K control controlling it. And this is especially for uh, the, uh, the, the widgets that control the uh, path of, of the sound. So muxes, uh, demuxes, uh, mixers, switches. And uh, DAPM will take this into account to understand what is the active route. So uh, the DAPM graph spans the whole sound card. So uh, each component, you see the codec and the amplifier in the example picture, uh, ha implements its own widgets and their internal routes, internal to the component. And then the sound card uh, implements the uh, widgets which are outside of various components, such as uh, the internal speaker or the uh, jack, con jack detection and so on. And it connects those together with the components and it also connects the widgets of two different components to each other. So it glues together everything. Uh, there is documentation for DAPM. Uh, in, it's in the kernel documentation, uh, so it's, it, it's, it's there since a long time. Uh, however, when uh, trying to understand DAPM, I found uh, the, especially the introductory parts, not uh, complete enough, at least for my understanding. And so I proposed a patch series, uh, which I sent a few days ago to improve the documentation. So it, it has better uh, introductory uh, um, sections uh, to, to introduce the topic. Um, I can also recommend about DAPM these two talks, both by Lars Peter Clausen. Uh, the first is a general overview of ALSA and its history. It also covers DAPM a bit. The second is DAPM specific. Unfortunately, there is no video recording available, but the slides are uh, useful anyway. So if you, there are lots of pictures, they are pretty clear, so you can get some more understanding of DAPM from them. So now let's uh, get into the technical details and uh, let's talk about widgets. So there are various categories of widgets. Let's have a look at the main ones. So um, uh, endpoint widgets are widgets where the sound originates from or uh, terminates to. So they are called uh, source and sync widgets. Um, some of these are the ADC or DAC, which is where uh, the analog sounds become digital or the other way around. And um, so the, this corresponds to uh, waveforms that will be stored in memory or get read from memory. And the other type is uh, the analog side uh, the, to, to, towards the outer world, so a speaker, line out, microphone, and so on. Those are the ones that will get enabled when you start a string. And uh, then there are pass-through widgets, so widgets that the sound needs to go through to go from the source to the sync. Uh, those are uh, sound modifiers, so PGA, which means a gain, basically, so an amplifier uh, or, or, or a gain, and, or effects, and routing widgets, uh, mixer, muxer, demuxers, and switches, which can modify the path of the sound. And finally, supply widgets, which are not uh, manipulating audio itself, but they are providing something to the other widgets, uh, typically clo a clock or current or voltage. So uh, let's see what DAPM actually does when, it, when you are uh, using it at runtime. Uh, so the f uh, basically, uh, whenever you change the, uh, the, the routing in any way by modifying a K control or by starting and stopping a string, uh, DAPM goes through 
two main steps. The first is to determine the new power state for the next state. Um, so it starts by in, uh, considering active uh, any uh, source and sync widget where the sound needs to go through. Uh, and then it, uh, it, this is uh, valid on so the two ends of, of the sound, or the sound stream. Uh, and so those are powered only if they are active and they have a route to an endpoint on the, in the opposite side of the graph, which is also active. So if you enable the speaker, but there is no PCM, it doesn't make sense to enable it. Uh, and then it goes through the path to find the, the, the route from the source to the sink, and then it considers uh, active and it turns on all the widgets along the path. Uh, so this will change whenever you change a key control that modifies the, 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 the routing. And so this is computed by DAPM automatically. You don't have to do anything. It's done internally. And Last thing is every supply widget that has a route to an active widget will be also powered on. So this is conceptually simple. Uh, it is walking around the graph, but uh, it's actually much more tricky. So the algorithm takes into account many aspects. Uh, the uh, one of the main goals of DAPM is to reduce to a minimum uh, pops and clicks when you uh, start, stop stream, you change routing or the mixing and so on. Uh, so there is a specific sequence to turn on and a specific sequence to turn off depending on the widget type. But you, you, when writing the device therapy, you normally don't need to take into account all of this because it's in the core. Uh, the second step of DAPM after computing the new state is to compare the previous, so the current and the following state, uh, power down all the newly disabled widgets, uh, then apply routing changes and power up all the newly enabled widgets. This is, again, to minimize pops and clicks. Um, okay, so uh, when you need to write a device driver for a codec or any other component that has uh, a flexible routing in, in it, you uh, need to know about a couple things. So the first is uh, the structure, a SoundSock Dappen widget, which is representing a single widget. It has a lot of fields. Uh, you can see here only the most relevant ones, especially those in this area here. You have a register offset of the register where you have the beat or the beats to enable the given widget, and then a shift, a mask, and other uh, information to actually be able to modify the specific beat or beats for that uh, control. You have a name, a stream name, uh, and other aspects. And you, you also have a function pointer. So in case the DAPM core is not clever enough to uh, handle uh, complicated actions you need for your widget, you can just provide a function pointer, and in your function, you implement whatever logic. For example, you need to enable a GPIO to enable an amplifier. Well, that's uh, not supported by DAPM. You can add your own function handler. Uh, however, now that you know about the structures, never use it because uh, there are, uh, it, it's pretty complicated to fill all the fields correctly. There are many macros, um, a lot of macros in the sockdapm.h include file that you can use to fill the structure for each type of widget. Uh, there are a few examples in the picture. Uh, the first is an input uh, widget, so it's just an input pin. The second is a supply, it has a name, a register, an offset, and so on. So it, DAPM will know which bit to set in which register. And uh, you can look also at the uh, second last one, which is actually a MOOCs. And so it also has uh, a key control associated to it, which is where you can control actually the, uh, the, the, the path you want to, to assign. Uh, you might notice that there is uh, a register offset in here, but there is no base to the uh, address space of your device. Uh, this works. Uh, so to, this works thanks to RegMap. RegMap is uh, a library component within the kernel, which originates from ASOC, but it's now uh, generic to uh, all the kernel, and it's used also outside of, of, of audio. Um, so RegMap is an abstraction to represent your um, a, a register that can be modified uh, and uh, you can use a reg map without uh, needing to explicitly uh, def tell the, the bus it is it is working on this is important for many audio codecs which can be controlled either 
over I square C or via SPI. And so uh, for this reason, regmap allows to just call regmap, uh, set register, and so on, uh, without uh, having to differentiate your code for the two buses. You just do that at the initialization time, and regmap internally knows how to access the bus. Uh, it, will, it has many more features. The map is worth a, a presentation on its own, but it's out of the, of the task of the topic here. So when you write uh, an audio driver in Linux, RegMap is close to mandatory. So it, it's really super recommended uh, because it's handy, but, but also because it's uh, something that is internally handled. So when you uh, add a new component, uh, so when you implement a codec driver, an amplifier driver, whatever, uh, you call SoundSock add component to add it to the kernel. And uh, then uh, it will uh, populate a reg map automatically for you, unless you do it already. And uh, so Alsa is already able to access your register. So it's very easy and free to use reg map in audio. Uh, next thing you have to define is, of course, the routes, the connections between the, the widgets. And for this, there is another structure, soundsock.pm route. This is much simpler. Uh, it, it has mainly three fields, um, which are the sync, so the destination, the, the, the end point where the sounds goes to, the source, which is where the sounds come from, and optionally a control in case you have a key control. Um, so it, you may notice that these are strings and not pointers to structures. Uh, a lot of things in ALSA are string based, so you, you, don't, um, you, you don't write pointers to object, you write, write the string name of another object, and then the core will do string matching to find it. So it's string matching everywhere in, in ALSA. Um, so if, for example, to define your, your routes, you can, uh, the typical way to do it is to write a, a, an array of these structures, and each element in the array has uh, always the source and the sync, and the, also the, um, the control if applicable for a mixer for, or a MOOCs in this example. And so you may notice that the direction is reversed, so from right to left. Uh, in the first line, for example, the analog in zero goes to PGA zero. So it's, I find it a bit counterintuitive, but once you know it, it's okay. Um, okay, so for the mixer here, uh, you have an idea of uh, how to implement them. So this, you have the text here, which is what will appear, for example, in Alsa Mixer, if you use that to select your routes. And this is how you pass the information to a, to a, a route about the key control. Um, okay, so uh, finally, when you define those two structures, it's very easy to add them to your a component sound component driver, a codec, for example. Uh, in this codec here, for example, we have, uh, as you can see in the sound sock component driver structure, you just have to fill the DAPM widgets and DAPM routes, uh, pointers pointing to your array and the number of elements they have, and the core will do the rest. So it will take them, connect all the routes, do all the string matching, and so on. Uh, but there are cases where uh, this is not enough. Uh, for example, if you have a driver that supports multiple similar versions of different, uh, different codecs, uh, so different uh, revisions of the codec have different features, uh, so you need to uh, detect the model at probe time and then configure the graph for the specific model. In that case, you can create more um, uh, more uh, arrays of widgets and routes, and then based on whatever logic, the model, the, the revision, whatever, you can call soundsock.pm new controls and soundsock.pm add routes to add them uh, at probe time. So your graph will be specific to the model you are implementing. Um, and finally, you need, well, you need to connect your graph to the die the DAI, which is the digital uh, audio interface. So basically the SPI bus or uh, AC97 bus, whatever bus connects to your, to your chip on the digital domain, uh, to your system and chip. Uh, to do this, well, you have uh, this, um, this technique. So you specify the, um, well, let's start from the bottom. Uh, when you define the die driver, so for example, your I2S interface, it has well, a name and then a playback stream, which has a stream name, hi-fi playback in this case, and the same for capture stream. So this string 
can be used uh, here uh, when you declare a DAC or an ADC um, component the widget. And the second parameter is the name of the stream, which will be associated by the core uh, to the stream itself. And this is then done again based on strict matching. You may notice that the string is not the same, so high five playback, but here we have left or right high five playback. So it's actually substring matching. The stream name must be a substring of your uh, stream name in the widget. So something to be careful about. Do copy paste and don't type twice the same string because it's too easy to get a small typo and nothing will work. Okay, so this is basically all you need to implement uh, DAPM in, in, in your code. So conceptually not much to do, maybe many lines because you have many widgets, but uh, this is all, all you need for DAP, using DAPM in your codec or whatever driver. Now, uh, let's have a look at how you can inspect what DAPM is doing at runtime to know uh, the status, what's happening, uh, which paths are enabled, and so on. So, well, as I said, DAPM is internal to the core. It works internally. It's not exposed to user space. You never need to ask DAPM to do something. You enable your streams, you change your mixing, mixing, routing, and it will do whatever is needed. So it, it just does what you need. Uh, so it works, you don't need to inspect it. So no problem. Uh, well, unless you want to uh, learn how it works or maybe you need to debug something, of course. Uh, so there are actually uh, observing, uh, tools to observe the, the state of DAPM. Uh, the core tool is DebugFS. So uh, DAPM exposes uh, each widget as a file in DebugFS. So in syskernel debug, or whatever you, you mount debugfs, uh, azog subdir, and then there is a subdir with the card name, which has a dapm subdir uh, with uh, one file per each widget that is at the card level, so the external connectors and so on, usually not many. And then there is another subdirectory for each component, which has a dapm uh, subdirectory with all the widgets inside the, the given component. The content of those files looks like in this code snippets, it's a few lines. You can see the state on or off in the first line and also information about the registers. It will be setting so it, you can check if it's correct according to the data sheet and uh, the stream name, whether it's active or not. And then the routes. So uh, you can have zero to n lines of output and zero to n lines of input. For example, a mixer has multiple inputs normally. Um, in this case, there is only one input and one output, uh, and you can see the name of the um, of the widget that is on the other side of the of the uh, of the link. Uh, when starting using this for my development, I noticed a problem uh, that the widget name can be ambiguous. For example, in uh, the, in this sound card here, the STM32 whatever, uh, there are two widgets called uh, Capture because they are in two different components. So the components have completely independent drivers. It's totally possible that you have a name collision. So I proposed a patch adding also the component name uh, on the same line. Uh, so it, it becomes non-ambiguous. And also uh, the, in this same series, there is um, an ad another line with the widget type. So you know that there is a, this is an ADC widget, which you might guess from the name, but it's not necessarily the case for all, all the cases. And also this is uh, parsable by uh, software tools. And about software tools, there is one which is called VisDapm. It is a very simple shell script. It's about 50 lines of code. It was written by uh, a Dimitris Papastamos and Wolfson Micro. Um, it is able to generate a graph, a, a picture with a graph of the DAPM state um, as a PNG picture. Um, it is based on the dot tool in GraphVids to, to do the graphic stuff. Uh, however, the repository disappeared from the Wolfram Micro website, but there are Git forks around. Uh, you, to use it, you have to call well, bitsdapm and then the directory or, uh, of your, the dapm directory for the component you want to inspect, and then the output file name. Um, the result looks like this. So it is um, a, representing the dapm state of a card. And you can see the green uh, circles mean it, 
the widget is active. Uh, so it, it was very useful when I uh, started using Dapm to understand what I was writing in the code. I like tools to visualize what's going on. And um, however, I also found a few uh, issues with the script. Uh, it, it needed a few tweaks to work on BusyBox shell on my target and uh, a few other uh, stuff. So it's a very simple script, you need to adapt it. Uh, so I started to uh, do some improvement, to fix the issues and add a little more features. But soon I realized that uh, basically I was going to rewrite the whole script to add even more features. And so I came up with a new tool, which is called Dapm Graph, uh, which I proposed in the same series I already uh, mentioned a few slides ago. It is uh, inspired by VizDapm. It is also using Dot from GraphViz to generate graphics. Uh, it is also a self-contained shell script, but it uh, it is more let's say, uh, embedded developers friendly. So it works on BusyBox shell, um, and uh, it has also a remote mode. So you, when you call it, you, in normal, normally you call Dapm and Graph the output file, which can be also a different format than PNG, and then the current name. But if you also pass dash R, it will connect over SSH to a target, and then uh, grab this Dapm status from there, bring it to your machine, and process it locally, so it's faster, and um, it doesn't need uh, graph feeds or whatever on the target. Um, and it has also a few more features. And the, uh, this is, it also has a nice command line uh, help um, to, with all the various available flags. And the result uh, looks like this. So it is uh, showing all the components in the graph, not only one. Uh, and also the connection between the two components, between different components, as you can see in this area of, of the graph here. Um, and so it, it, it has been submitted. I hope it will be accepted, so it will be used, available in the kernel source tree. And well, uh, last thing I want to, to mention is that uh, if you need to go even lower in, in the backend, lower level to understand what's going on in the code, which is something I did to understand better uh, what Dapm does, uh, at the sequence of operations, I've been using uh, F-Trace. Uh, which is very nice for this kind of thing. And uh, but in my case, I use trace command because I'm lazy. Uh, you can see the command line there, but you can use normal ftrace, whatever. Uh, there are events uh, exposed by uh, azoc. Um, so you can see here, or you can just pass azoc and it's the same. And I also added, sorry, uh, the uh, functions from my codec um, to see what when my codec driver was being called, and I used the function graph tracer uh, to play a file. So I could see that the first thing uh, that happens is that your hardware parameters for, the, for your codec is called to set the format and NDNS, whatever. Uh, and then uh, Dapm Power Widgets does all the Dapm work. Uh, it emits some uh, F-trace events to tell when it started, when it's finished. And the first thing it does is it uh, computes the new state in SoundSock Dapm widget power uh, to fill the, the, the new route to, to see what needs to be turned on off. And then it, it calls sound sock Dapm path to propagate the state through the various widgets. And uh, when it's finished walking the graph, it prints some statistics and then it starts calling all the um, um, all the, some well, all of your widgets to modify all the registers. For this, it emits uh, these uh, F3 sevens um, here a soundsock bias level start and done for each component. These are called in separate K threads. Uh, that means they will be interleaved in our F trace output, not very readable. So I, I've used max CPUs equals one on, on the kernel command line. So that becomes linear and more easy to understand. Uh, also for, uh, if you have an event associated to a widget, you will also see the uh, soundsock Dapm widget event start and done uh, before and after it, it's calling your event uh, callback. And at the end of all of this, audio streaming starts. And at the end of audio streaming, everything is, is rolled back. So basically the same sequence in reverse. Um, it's worth pointing out that you can also have f events for uh, regmap. So you can also see very generally when each register is modified. And so you get even more low level information and uh, that's all so uh, I'd like to thank uh, as a maintainer Mark Brown for reviewing my slides and proposing improvements and that's also uh, any questions 
Uh, not sure uh, I completely get the question. So uh, uh, you said the, the, the card is uh, creating all the configuration and the question is what can be moved to device tree? Yeah, right. uh, actually, uh, well, it's already something you can put in device tree in the sense that uh, so the, the old way to implement a, a, an ASOC sound card was to implement your own driver, which populates the various components and glues together them. But uh, nowadays, it's uh, rarely needed because usually uh, you can use one of the standard uh, sound cards. They are called uh, simple sound card, simple graph card, and similar. Uh, maybe I can show you something. Um, I don't know. Where is it? No, I cannot show anything. So, uh, but anyway, there are those uh, drivers which are um, generic sound cards, basically, and you define in device tree what you can uh, what you can do with them. Uh, so, you basically, you define in, the, in device tree. You have uh, the codec under maybe a nice C bus or whatever, and a, uh, your um, your DAI, so I square S controller or similar. And then you just add the new node in. Well, but this has to work somehow. Well, so. There is also a thing named topology, where you write oh, yeah. your topology in a text format in user space and compile it in terms of runtime. So yeah, but that's horrible. I mean, I don't know which one is horrible. It seems like there have been a couple of attempts to solve this. Yeah, Intel does with the topology, and the rest of us. So I think this is the one I, I showed in, in the slides. And so the, uh, yeah. it's here, I think. We can get it. So in the root node, you have this sound node, which is your card. So in an embedded system, a card is not a physical object. It, it comes out of the interconnection of multiple components. So in this case, you are using the audio graph card. Um, it's a sound card driver, which is generic. It, and you need to point it to your DAI, uh, and so it, which will turn, in turn uh, be connected to your codec. And you have the routing here, so you can connect the various widgets. So this is basically how it glues together things. So it's generic. Uh, and it works, I think, for 99% of the cases. There are actually multiple, uh, there are three options. Audio, uh, simple audio card, or something like that. Audio graph card, which is used here, and also audio graph card two. I, I don't know what, what it changes, what it, the difference, but it's pretty new. I, okay, yeah. You want the mic? Um, that you, you describe in the drivers how the codec is working, how your amplifier is working, the internal widgets that they have, and then in device you describe on that particular board this is like how my codec is, is connected to my amplifier, how this is connected to the DI on the SOC side, that kind of stuff. So that's why. Yeah, Good. That, that makes sense because the codec is static. There's no configuration that you do in the user, so what yeah. that part of it is, like that blue. Correct. Yep. Yep. So basically, if you look like at this picture, if you look at the schematics of your product, a, a box in the schematics equals one thing in one object in the device tree, one node in the device tree, which is a device, which is its compatible string, which is the product name and vendor and name, uh, and everything else is implemented in the code in C. So that's the, the abstraction with device tree. Okay, other questions? No? Okay, so thank you.
Enjoy the rest of the conference.